police say three missing boys may be in extreme danger. A frantic search in the town of Morency. The search for three missing boys growing more desperate with every passing hour. We know their dad lied to police. The brothers are ages five, seven, and nine. They're from the town of Morency, Michigan. An all-out search near the Michigan-Ohio border. The FBI now getting involved. This community is beginning to fear the worst. Still no sign denied of Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner Skelton. This is where it all began. This is the house Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner Skelton called home before their parents, John and Tanya, got divorced. Everyone who knew them says they were smart, happy little boys. That was seven years ago. And still, no answers, no closure, no end in sight. We've covered every twist and turn along the way. And for the better part of a year, we've been working on a project that goes deeper into the story than ever before. The producer of this show, Jeremy Allen, created a podcast which is helping us uncover new information about this case. We're calling it Shattered Black Friday, and it offers perspective like we've never seen or heard. Jeremy and I have been working together on many of these stories. You'll hear his voice occasionally throughout this hour. From Michigan to Montana, from airplanes to Amish, the search for the missing Skelton brothers started right here in Morency on Black Friday, 2010. Friday, November 26, 2010, the day after Thanksgiving, the boy's mother, Tanya Skelton, tells Morency police officer Ryan Hillard her husband, John, was supposed to bring the boys back to her, but he never did. An Amber Alert would be issued. The FBI would come to town. Massive searches spanning down through Ohio would begin. And I wonder, are they scared? Are they crying for me? Tanya, the boy's mom, left heartbroken. So it's hard to imagine them hurting for me. The people of the small town felt Tanya's pain, and many to this day still think of the boys daily. Everybody thinks about it, but time does cover things up. It's just, uh, it's heartbreaking to me. Andrew was nine, Alexander seven, and the youngest, Tanner, only five years old at the time. Over the years, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children created these age-progressed photos of what the boys might look like. There's yellow ribbons hanging on some doors. Detective Lieutenant Jeremy Brewer took over the case back in 2013. That's when Morency Police Chief Larry Weeks left for the same position in Eaton Rapids, Michigan. Brewer can't share many details in connection with the case. He can only say they're closer to solving it now than they were back in 2010. On a case like this with the magnitude, with the resources that we have directed towards it, I firmly believe without a doubt that we will get some, some type of closure on it one day. And what about John, the father? His original story, he gave the boys to a group. This part is still a mystery. The boys are missing. A group has never been found or come forward. John's stories have changed. For now, he sits in the Bellamy Creek Correctional Facility in Ionia, Michigan. His charge, unlawful imprisonment. The last person that ever saw them was their father. And seven years later, we still don't have them. I mean, that story is pretty tragic. Their father, John Skelton, claims he was trying to keep his boys out of harm's way. Tanya Skelton was charged with fourth degree criminal misconduct in the late 90s. She had sex with a 14 year old boy. John says she was abusing her own sons. Tanya says it's absolutely not true. Detective Brewer keeps an eye on John in prison. He also talks to him from time to time. He says the key to this case is simple. The innocence of children is such a pure thing that we have. When the integrity of that gets hurt, um, people can identify with that. This is his Facebook page and it says, I love my wife very much. May God and Tanya forgive me. Why would he not um, come to the family? You know, if, if you need to take the children somewhere, um, 
why take them to somebody else? I don't know what's going on. I don't know where my kids are. I'm a mess. I, I don't know. Are my sons laying in this house? Did he flip out and do something? I don't know what's going on. I don't know where my kids are. I know that their dad is now telling the hospital he tried to kill himself. Where are my sons? What have you done to them? He's the one that holds the key. Are you okay with uh, not seeing your kids anymore? He is the one that can make this all be solved. Prayers tonight for Andrew, Alex, and Tanner. The three Skelton brothers police say remain in grave danger the longer they go missing. This is the boy's father, John Skelton. His sons were last in his care Thanksgiving Day. There's part of me that wants to think that there is someone else that helped and eventually they will the guilt will get to them. He took those boys out of harm's way. If anybody else knows something besides John, I would I would say it's them. Them boys, they ain't no problem, them boys. His boys are safe and sound. John's parents, John's sister, have never contacted me after that first day. Um, that's suspicious to me. That has all been investigated. I was investigated, I was interrogated as well. My house was searched, my computer was searched, all of my stuff was gone through as well. There were interviews with school teachers, school administrators, church people, friends, all kinds of people, um, school administrators and teachers who are trained to see abuse in children, who said to the police, I have never seen more children more loved and cared for by their mother. Those children were not abused. There is no way. And anyone who truly knows me knows that my children come first, always have, always will. My dream job was to be a mom and within the first year of getting married, I was pregnant for my first child. And this year marks 30 years that I've been a mom. And it is the greatest job in the world. And now I get to be a grandma too. But to say that I abused my sons kills me. Long before I met John, I made a mistake in life. And I paid that price and asked forgiveness and moved forward. John knew that before he met me. He knew about it before we ever started dating. And that is um, a selfish, low blow move to pull that out and say that that's what I was doing to my children because that is no way near what happened in my life several years ago. The more that I can talk about my boys and share their story, the greater chance that that one person that we are waiting to see our story that knows something, um, the greater chance of them seeing it. So they were really close. They were, the, the five of them were really close. And then Andrew and Mason. Tanya sat there in her living room, talked about her boys, and never shed a tear. 
She says it's important, she thinks, to stay strong. Because you don't know. Are the boys out there? Are they going to see? Are they going to hear? And the loving, caring sons that I raise to the ages, they don't, they don't like mom to cry and be upset. They want mom, this is who they know. This is what they want, you know. So I don't, because someday we will be back together. I will find them. It may not be until I'm buried, but I will find them. And I don't want them to think that I was just a shell of a person in our time apart. If you were going to dispose of someone that was a very good location. Every time I come here, it's, uh, it's an emotional time. Uh, it's very difficult because I just can't imagine um, what happened to these boys and uh, what John may have done to them or done with them. And so, yeah, it's very difficult. Still to come, he's baffled investigators for years. John Skelton reveals what his last night with his boys was like. The thing that's most forefront in my mind, to be honest with you, is that they're just not found. You know, where are they? You know, why haven't we been able to find them? The child abduction cases, those, those haunt you. They stay with you the rest of your life. There's growing anger at the boy's father, John Skelton, who says he gave the boys to a mystery woman he has an internet relationship with. There was information we developed very quickly that gave us the indication that um, uh, that was not a factual story. So, you know, when we, when we made that connection that that story was most likely false mm -hmm. and that's the information that was given to us, it really gave us real concern. The father's story and the holes in that story just really concerned me. You know, the, his changing of the facts of what happened. I took the initiative to contact the state police operations center and initiate the Amber Alert. And I remember that call very specifically in my mind. Tell that me about that call. When I spoke to the lieutenant at the operations center, he goes, well, I don't think you know what's going to happen when I make this notification. I remember him saying that specifically. And no truer words have ever been spoken because I could never have fathomed what would, have, what, what would unfold in the next several hours. Local, state, and federal law enforcement agents have been combing through the rural area. And it was at that point then when the FBI and the state police and the supporting agencies started to arrive and then we certainly ramped up the investigation immensely from that point forward. I mean, it was like Morenzi had been taken over. Yeah, for such a small community to have um, so many law enforcement and public safety personnel and the volunteers, it was, you know, significantly increased its percentage of population. All of a sudden, you're invaded by the Michigan State Police and the FBI. And you know, that certainly is an overwhelming, overwhelming thing to have. It's like almost like the makeup of the town just overnight, like just changed. It just yeah. kind of like, it was like everyone took over. It's like, yeah, it's almost like the population doubled, uh, you know, in a 12 hour period. Since we can last pinpoint the boys in the, in the backyard, on Thursday afternoon and that we know uh, that the vehicle wasn't at the home at a period of time there, we certainly would want any leads that we could gather. I felt like we were going to find them. I felt like we were going to get to the point where either John was going to disclose to us where they were at or with the enormous searching that was taking place that we would turn them on. We were trying to, to locate them as quickly as possible. And as the days wore on, it got more and more difficult uh, and then the varying stories that we received from John over time. Uh, just made me believe that, you know, it was clearly he was not going to 
uh, at that time disclose you know where the boys were at. One of the challenges that I had in leading the investigation was that um, we continued to have people looking for them in you know gas stations, you know, and uh, uh, donut shops, whatever, and flea you know. markets, mm -hmm. and the and the evidence in in my belief just did not lead that way. She believes she spotted Andrew Alexander and Tanner here at the flea market with a woman matching the description also given by another Ohio woman, a worker at a donut shop in Sandusky. We had a good feeling early on that, that maybe they were out there because um, there were a lot of, of, of leads coming in that they were, low, you know, they were seen in a rest area, they were seen at a restaurant. I needed people to be looking for them in places not alive. I needed people to start focusing on, you know, the, the ditches, their, you know, their properties and things that where they may have been, uh, bodies may have been disposed of. I remember going, you know, into Ohio mm -hmm. and there was, it looked like an old abandoned school or something. And I, it was one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen. But I remember in the middle of the night, just, you know, searching this place, this abandoned, and there were people living in it. I remember opening a door and these people were in there living in this in this place. You know, it was kind of spooky. Um, but you know, if you were going to dispose of someone, that was a very good location. It's around 4:29 that on Friday morning that John's phone is Ping. located moving d down near. Uh, down into Ohio. Uh, yeah, 429, he's about 3.3 miles from his home. Um, and then and again at uh, 5 a.m., uh, he's near Holiday City, uh, Pioneer, Ohio, with, his, with the phone. And now this was which day exactly? Cause, because Thursday was Thanksgiving. Correct, yes, this was uh, the very early morning hours of what would be referred to as Black Friday. We began uh, driving and looking at that location, directing search parties to that location. Oh, just indicating from what we have from the phone records, uh, I believe the route that we're taking right now would, would be the most direct route to where the, the uh, cell towers indicate. Um, down here it's pretty rural, so the phone towers, uh, there aren't too many of them. And so uh, due to how the phone records and the towers came back, giving us the timestamps, um, it would lead us to believe that he probably stayed on, at least for the most part, some of the main roads um, traveling in the direction that he did. An area in which the cell phone did track towards uh, was an area that uh, John was very familiar with. He was a truck driver and drove to that area. Um, for some of the truck driving routes that he had. Uh, we also know that he had spent some time with, uh, I believe with Tanya there, it was kind of a special place for them. So let's talk about the cell phone hits and specifically, how do we know John Skelton was in Holiday City that morning? Well, we don't know exactly where he was. We just know that the, uh, the phone pings or the phone tower hits put us in an area that was very consistent with the low distance between Holiday City and Morency. And knowing what we know from some of the things that um, Skelton has said, along with um, talking with family members, this was kind of an important spot uh, to them. Um, I don't know if they had some family outings here, some different things that happened in Holiday City or around this area. So it was just very consistent with the information that the evidence led to, along with some family confirmations that this was a good area. And he knew this area like the back Absolutely. of his hand. Right. The, tur the turnpike is right here, the 8090 turnpike. And this area was thoroughly searched. Absolutely. Yes, we searched. We had some information that uh, put us in this area, M mainly the cell phone pings, but some other things as well. And we had search teams down here for multiple days, um, searching um, buildings, hotels, um, dumpsters, uh, pole barns, everything that was in the air that could be searched, we searched. Because it sounds like initially the investigators who were on the case thought, okay, this is where the boys Correct. are. Correct. This was, again, with all the information that we had leading up days after it happened, we really thought this was the place where we would find the boys. And it is a very, I mean, you described it, it's very rural. It's very, I mean, there are a lot of back roads. There is a lot of farmland. Right. 
And in order for us to search, I mean, we search everything that we can, even with a search party of 100 people. You can search an area or an open field like that very thoroughly. Um, however, uh, there's just hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of acres. And so it really is a needle in a haystack. And uh, we searched the best we could um, with the evidence and relating to the evidence that we had, but there's just no telling. And then at 5 a.m. approximately, what happened? At approximately 5 a.m., we received no further tower hits. So basically that means that the cell phone company um, did not have any more data to provide to us indicating where that phone would be. So the phone either was turned off, which I believe probably happened, uh, or the phone could have died, battery could have died, and then we did not get any further um, data from the phone tower hits until I think it was like 6.34 in the morning and that phone was back at his house. There's been a lot of theories, a lot of information that we have acted on uh, in reference to that, but absolutely. I mean, we see three dumpsters over here that, uh, you know, and I know way back when those were searched. Uh, I know everything in this area was searched very extensively. Um, it's not to say that this was the exact area, but given everything else that we know, this could, ver that, this could very well be, um, you know, uh, where the boys would have been at five o'clock in the morning. We just have the evidence. We just have the tower hits, we just have the mind of John Skelton um, and what we know about him. And unfortunately, it leads us to a place like this where we're talking about dumpsters and talking about landfills. Tanya and I have had a very, we've had a lot of, a lot of discussion throughout the, the last few years, a lot of heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Um, and she knows that as time goes by that statistically um, it does not look good um, to find the boys alive. According to the cell phone hits or the pings, where are we now in the timeline? So it is now about 645, 646 in the morning on Black Friday. And the next cell phone ping that we get is back here at the house at 112 Congress Street in Morency. So there is a span of time that is unaccounted for. Correct. The last tower record uh, hit that we have was in the area of Holiday City at about um, around 5 a.m. And now we have about an hour and 45 minutes that have elapsed before the phone hits here. For about a half hour drive, right? Correct. Right. So, right, yeah, there's about a 30 minute drive uh, back from that area to here. So that we have a span of 30 to 45 minutes to where we have no idea. What do you think went on in this house on, on that Friday? <sighs> After he came back from wherever he was at 6.45 in the morning and we know his cell phone was turned back on. Right. Or came back within range, right? Right, well we know that um, we know that he was active on his, uh, on his phone sending some text messages and some emails. Uh, we know that um, he had to have packaged up some type of belongings because he then took those to a family member's house that didn't live too far away from here. His own belongings? Correct. And said he wanted someone else in the family to get those because he um, didn't expect to be around or to be... Uh, it was very elusive in his, his comments to the family, but just said he wanted so-and-so to get his clothing. Um, so he gave away his clothes? He gave away some of his belongings, I'll say. Some of his belongings. That day? That day. I really did believe the boys were safe and that maybe they were with someone in the Amish community because it made sense. And now I just don't know. And later, the one man who can unlock the mystery opens up for the first time in six years. My conversation with John Skelton. Much of the speculation around where Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner really could have gone focuses on Amish country and if their father, John, really could have taken them there. Amish communities have settled all over Michigan. There are even more in Ohio, Indiana, and Pennsylvania. John originally told investigators he gave the boys over to a group so they could be safe. And like all the leads they followed, detectives also closely examined this theory. Was it likely? They really didn't know. What are we gonna ask the Amish? So, you know, I wonder, could the boys really be out here? Could, would someone 
in the Amish community who has no access to newspapers, TV, would they really care for three boys as their own and keep them under wraps? I mean, is that even possible? Do you remember seven years ago, the boys from Morency that went missing? Oh yeah, small ones. If someone brought children here, would the Amish community, would they take them in? It could be, yeah. The Amish might care for children who were dropped off, but they'd know these children. They'd know they were the missing boys from Morency. I think they would call the, probably call the police or someone. So John Skelton's story about dropping the boys off was starting to sound even more far-fetched than ever. But this was just one person's opinion. We read a lot of papers, yeah, as far as we know, we know what's going on. We, know we stopped off at a farm yeah, just yeah, off a main road. We meet Jason, who's open and inviting. My mom told me you can go ahead and look at the house. You want it? Sure, if she's willing Absolutely. to. Jason tells us his father built this home, and his family has lived here their entire lives. Hi, hello. We're greeted by Jason's family. They show us around their home. They show us their newspaper, the budget, and we start talking about the skeleton case. How probable was it the Amish would take these boys in? And I don't think that we would, anyone would do that. No, our churches and families, we're all together. Sure. Everybody knows what everybody does. We're all back and forth, and yeah. I, I don't believe so. But that'd be strange if all of a sudden there'd be three boys in the area, and everybody would be wondering what there was. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. say anybody would yeah, take them I've in and hide them. I've been here all my life, and I've never heard a song like that. While the Amish don't seem convinced, no one is ruling out the possibility. Making sure. Mm -hmm. I would disagree. Okay. We don't need to hold you hostage. You guys can get up and move around if you want to. But <laughs> I'm not sure if Did any of you think that as we come on this seven year anniversary that we would still be in the same position in terms of the investigation and where it stands? No, I didn't. Me either. So I can't even begin to imagine the searches and in those initial few days. Can you describe for me what that was like? Was it chaos? Was it... I think some of it was well organized. But then you'd get those little tips and it would bring back that glimmer, you know, and so you would rush to wherever that scene was or that tip was. And then the letdown would occur again. It was a... It was a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to describe it. It was with defiance that we were met when we were seeking information that could resolve this case. Um, the stories weren't consistent. Um, and we believe that we weren't being provided truthful information after you know, substantial effort. So that our, our frustration was high, but we had to track down every lead and do what we needed to do as professionals. I mean, I can speak for myself, man, I still have hope. I mean, that hope hasn't gone away. Um, certainly, I've stated before what I believe the outcome to be, but it doesn't mean I don't still have hope. Um, we all well, want hope for the best outcome. And I think the hope, I, I don't know that it's, at this point, seven years, is the hope a positive outcome. It's a hope for resolution. So it's hard to imagine them hurting for me. It was so hard to watch Tanya. She just kind of curled up and she didn't want to talk and she cried and she had headaches and she got sick and I'm thinking, how is she even existing? You know, how, how can she do anything? And, she, she was strong enough inside, I think, and, and I am proud of her for her advancing as she has. I don't know if I could have done all that. You know, when you have the boys this young, it's just, it drives you even harder. I mean, in my office are Tanya's pictures, the boys' pictures. I walk in every day to my office and I look at that. Just, it's hard. <laughs> Can't imagine. 
She has been inside once though with police and she could not believe what she saw inside. Things that were glass were busted. Um, the big curio cabinet was smashed to pieces along with everything that was inside of it. What did you feel when you went into the house, Ryan? Um, it, just something didn't seem right. Um, I can't really put it into words. It, it just didn't, things didn't add up in the house. Just, and the story that he was giving just didn't add up as well. That scene um, was troubling because it wasn't a normal scene. It wasn't, we've been to, through many crime scenes and this was the intensity, um, the things that were destroyed. There wasn't anything usable in that house. Uh, the appliances, the cords were cut, the keys were cut, the hutch was knocked over, the dishes were broken. Um, the house was fundamentally destroyed. John Skelton and his family often spent time here, and police say that he used his cell phone near this location Friday morning. It's likely that this one man holds holds the keys, has all has the answers, and we don't. I mean, if I were in law enforcement, if I were you, anyone involved in the case, I'd be furious. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, furious, angry, um, uh, who I am now, if I could just have a minute with him. Would you want to talk to him, Tanya? I think so. I want to remind him of his sons and the happy times and all the, the things and want answers as to why you would do this to our sons, your sons. Tomorrow would it be birthday number 12. 12. For my baby. You wonder. What do you wonder about? Who would he be? What does he look like? All of them. Because then in two weeks we get Alexander's, and then two weeks later is Andrew's. So. It's a tough time. Uh, very tough. They're missing out on two grandparents that love them and an aunt and a daddy that loves them dearly. The belief is that they're safe, right? I believe that 100%, yes. Who's going to get the last laugh? Up next, face to face with John Skelton. What happened during our interview that moved him to tears? says they're safe and sound. A very specific message John Skelton asked his parents to share during the first visit they had with their son where he's housed here at the Lucas County Jail. The visit lasted a half an hour. Via video, his parents, Roxanne and William, convinced their three grandsons, Andrew, Alexander and Tanner, missing since Thanksgiving, are alive and well. They say their son wouldn't tell them where they are, only that he didn't want them to be with their mother 
Tanya. Seems far-fetched, this story. Right, it does. <laughs> it does, I'm not gonna deny it. Yeah, the people that are, are gonna question all this and say, well, there's no way that there's a group that can do this and uh, that's impossible that like these kids haven't found the internet or a phone or something like that. What do you say to those kind of... Well, I've, I've thought about that. I question that too. Why hasn't them boys? Con Did anybody ever think maybe they're happy where they're at? The Marines police, are, there's no way you can hide children. Well, I pulled up 186 cases of underground children that have been hidden. A few years back, I was filling down here in Jacksonville. I was filling up one of my, my other truck with fuel, and I was had my back there, and a gentleman come up behind me and he asked me not to turn around and said, I know of your plight, I know your sons are okay. Really? And I says, thank you. And that was it? That was it. You didn't turn around? It pops in my head all the time. Why haven't they contacted somebody? Right. Maybe they're happy. They would bring him into the courtroom, no clothes on, and and this thing, and it hurt so bad that I couldn't even watch it anymore. And I told my husband, I said, John, I've got to go up there. They were treating him so bad, not, I mean, so bad. He said to tell you that his boys are safe and sound. His kids are fine, I know this as a grandmother. I have a grandmother's heart, and I know this. I don't know where they are. If I did, they wouldn't be there, but. Right, because that, that's what I was saying. I said, well, even, like, if the story's true with John, because I don't know. Yeah. If the story's true. I don't know. <laughs> right. Well, they say it's 100%. You, do you feel 100% that John gave the kids to somebody? Yes. You do believe that? Yes. And you believe that those kids are safe with yes. whoever that group is? Yes. You're 100% com confident that your son is telling the truth? Yes. And I think that's the important thing in all this is, I think everyone's waiting to find out if John's telling the truth, right? Of course they are. Yeah. And then it's gonna, who's gonna get the last laugh? So you, you believe that to this day, those boys I are fine? I believe those boys are fine. You believe that or do you want to believe that? No, I believe it. I believe it full in my heart. I believe it totally, 100% that them boys are fine. Is there a victim or is it just the boys that were victims in a kind of a messed up household for a little while? I think only the boys are the victims because they've, lost they've they're protected but they're missing out on two grandparents that love them and an aunt and a daddy that loves them dearly and i'm sure tanya loves them too i mean you know everyone's a victim i guess in one way or the other what John promised the boys the night he said goodbye. Breaking news at this hour along 75 near 7 mile landlord tenant dispute turns deadly. The manhunt is just getting underway. We'll have the night cam on the scene at 11. Also tonight, what caused dozens of cases of Legionnaire's disease in the Flint area? New studies claiming to have some answers. Ben? Kim, widespread snow on 4 Live radar all across the area. That's going to leave us with a couple inches overnight, but it's not the only time we're going to get snow this week. More on that next at 11. Unbeatable. It's been many years since we've talked to John until recently when he came out of segregation and reached out to us to share a glimpse of what his life has been like. John's life has been one of solitude for the last seven years. He spent almost his entire sentence behind bars in segregation, otherwise known as solitary confinement, which meant he was alone for 23 hours out of the day. 
But in September, they transferred John to protective custody. Because of the high-profile nature of his case, corrections officers feel John isn't safe in the general population. Sources tell us John has had little or no contact with his family. In fact, his mom, Roxanne, has visited him in prison only twice. Both times, she could only talk to John from behind glass. Back on October 4th, John reached out to us. He sent us this letter. This was the first time in more than six years we'd heard from him. Dear Sandra, I'm doing okay. My vision is rapidly going. As far as how I'm being treated, I was put in segregation for four years. I never did anything wrong, and it was never explained to me why they felt I needed to be in segregation when every other prison I was in, I was in general population. Just recently, on September 30th, 2017, they let me out of the segregation unit. Now, out of segregation, John had access to a computer and email. We exchanged several messages back and forth. We set up a time to talk on the phone, and twice, John left us sitting and waiting. Detectives say John likes to manipulate and control, and this time, we saw it firsthand. He has a need to be in control and a need to be in charge of any given circumstances. And being in prison, you don't have a lot of that. And so when he does have the opportunity to exercise his right to be in control of the situation, you know, it's not surprising that he said one thing and did another. Then John put us on his visitor list. We set up a date and headed out to Ionia. I'm hoping John follows through on his word and does in fact meet with us. He has said he wants to share his side of the story. Continue on to East Grand River Avenue. He's the man who holds all the answers. He kind of holds all the keys. And he's the missing link in all of this. So that's why I'm really hoping he comes out today and chats with us like he said he would. We're here. I walked in with a notebook and pen, which I was told wasn't allowed. We weren't allowed to record our visit in any way. Okay, we'll see what happens now. After several trips to the car and back, I finally made it through to start going through the security check. That's when a female officer searched me several times. I went through a metal detector. She patted me down twice, then asked me to take off my boots so she could inspect those from the inside. They let me put them back on, gave me a badge, took my driver's license, and lastly, stamped my hand with invisible ink. The process felt like it took forever, but finally, after a series of doors opened, they escorted me to a small room full of prisoners, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw John Skelton sitting alone. We talked for more than two hours, which was all that was allowed before visiting hours ended. Remember, we weren't allowed to bring any of our cameras inside prison, so all I had to rely on was my memory. I couldn't get back to the car fast enough so I could get everything I was thinking and feeling on tape as quickly as possible. You can tell my I adrenaline was pumping. I think I was in shock more than anything else. Shock that he followed his word and he showed up and he was there. I walked in the room, we made eye contact, he shook my hand and he started sobbing, which caught me off guard. John apologized for crying. He said he was so emotional because he couldn't believe he was having contact with a visitor. I was sitting in the chair next to him. I didn't realize we would be in such close proximity. We were side by side the entire time. And to my surprise, John wasn't wearing any restraints. His handcuffs, belly chain and shackles had all been removed. I asked him about the boys right off the bat. Through tears, John said, I miss their voices. John said they loved picking vegetables together, mowing the lawn and doing dishes. John said, you can ask anyone in Morency or any of the inmates here. They will tell you I was a good dad. I would never hurt my boys or anyone. On their last night together, which John remembers as being the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, John says he made the boys their favorite meal, fried chicken, and a cake to celebrate Andrew's birthday. John said they all ate dinner together at the table, then watched a karate movie before going to bed. John says he had already made arrangements with a group he calls the Underground Sanctuary to give the boys away. 
And on Thanksgiving night at 10, John says he watched as two women and a man who looked like he was in his 60s pulled up to the house in their van to take Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner away. So do you know the location or whereabouts of your children? No, I do not. John's story sounded familiar, and when we went back through our archives, we found this from one of John's early court appearances. Were they accompanied by anybody? Yes. Who were they accompanied by? A person in a van. Pardon me? A person in a van. Did you know the person? I knew the organization, but I didn't know the person, no. What organization? Uh, the organization that took John says he told the boys they were going to have a better life with a new family who lived on an Amish farm in Ohio along the Indiana border. John says he promised the boys their new family would buy them the farm boots they'd been asking for and let them ride on a tractor whenever they wanted. Breaking down in tears for the fourth time during our interview, John said he regrets giving his boys away. On November 26, 2010, a mother faced her worst nightmare. No doubt by now, it's been obvious. We've been working on a big project behind the scenes here at Local 4, a podcast to go hand in hand with our Black Friday coverage. In the podcast, you'll hear more details and information about this case and the people involved than you ever have before. The host of the podcast, Emotions Run High, producer Jeremy Allen. We've been working together on these stories for many months. I'm trying to talk to John's family. Which I haven't had much luck with. You need to leave. If you come back here again, I'm calling the cops. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where my kids are. But we begin with breaking news from Montana. That's where the discovery of remains believed to be three children has drawn the attention of Michigan State Police. It's a possible new development in the case of the Skelton brothers missing since 2010. In the days and weeks to follow, we'd find out so much more about the developments in Montana. This is the tiny two-bedroom cottage on a residential street in Missoula. The house vacant since last September when the old tenants were evicted. The property owner hired a professional cleaning crew to scrub the place from top to bottom. When the cleaners started going through a shed in the backyard, they found a box and made a horrific discovery. Human bones. Police were called right away. They reached out to an anthropologist at the University of Montana who determined the bones belonged to three children. She estimated their ages to be between two and four, six and ten, and five to eight years old. Were there any missing children's cases in the city of Missoula? Police in Missoula admitted they were puzzled. Then came word Michigan State Police confirmed they were working with Missoula Police to see if there is a connection between the bones and Andrew, Alexander, and Tanner Skelton. These bones would range in age from X to 99 years old. Kirsten Green is the anthropologist who got the call from police to help yeah, with the investigation. We, we aged each tooth actually that we had, every single tooth that we had available, and we came up with an average based on all the age ranges of each tooth. And it's based on things like root development. We went back to Tanya to ask what she thinks about the bones now that she's had more time to process everything. I want the answers yesterday. I don't dwell on it a whole lot because until I have answers, I don't need to put myself through that type of unnecessary stress. We won't know the results of the testing for many months, possibly even as late as June. Until then, the folks in this town and the family will be watching and waiting. From all of us here at Local 4, thank you so much for joining us and good night.